social attitudes and brought awareness to the urgency of our need to shift to a low carbon uh, energy system. However, it was only really in COP26 of uh, November 2021 when finance became really front and center of the debate and the understanding was that the banking sector really needs to shift its funding from um, fossil fuels to low carbon energy. And it's a systemic change that's needed. Um, trillions of dollars need to be moved um, from the fossil fuel sector into the green sector. So one of the most important, important initiatives to be launched in Glasgow was the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, GFANS. And a particular subset of this alliance is the Net Zero Banking Alliance, the NZBA. And the NZBA involves um, over 100 banks um, who represent trillions of dollars worth of assets. Um, and this was a alliance that was uh, led by Mark Carney um, under the UN. And these banks have signed up to um, net zero by 2050 um, and committed to these science-based targets that means that we'll be able to reach the Paris climate um, trajectory of 1.5 degrees C warming. But in October last year, some of the most important banks in this alliance, including JP Morgan, some of the big American banks, um, threatened to quit. And um, this was because under the Alliance, they were obliged to phase out the development financing and to the facilitation of new and unabated fossil fuel assets, including coal. And they felt that in this current geopolitical um, climate, this was too stringent um, and they, uh, yeah, they threatened to pull out the Alliance. Um, and around this backlash, what's now happened is that they've um, actually decided that the rules are now that they'll be encouraged but not required to to follow um, to follow this mandate. In addition, a recent report has come out that highlighting um, the need to shift from um, uh, from fossil fuels to low carbon finance. In particular, the target has to be a four to one lending ratio, which means four dollars of fossil fuel financing every one dollar, sorry, four, four, four dollars of low carbon um, financing for every one dollar of fossil fuel financing. And this is the energy supply banking ratio. Um, and this is what's required to meet the Paris targets. But actually, if we look at what's been going on in the in the most recent years, most of the major um, funders are actually closer to a one to one ratio. So we're still very far from what's needed. So this is where our, our analysis is starting. Um, there's been these kind of reports are generating attention around greenwashing in the banking sector. And we really want to explore the question, are banks really shifting the, their portfolios from fossil fuels to green energy? And how can this transition be pushed forward? So first, um, I'm gonna give you kind of an overview of what this um, landscape looks like in terms of fossil fuel and green financing. Um, we'll then uh, look at how network analysis comes into this, in particular, in terms of ne the networks of lending in these two sectors. And finally, I'm gonna hand over to Max and he's gonna present a stylized model of um, lending networks, in particular, the fossil fuel network, and explore divestment scenarios, asking the question, what is the most effective way to collapse fossil fuel lending network? So our data uh, comes from Bloomberg New Energy, sorry, Bloomberg um, Finance. And we have two data sets, one of which is a deal level data set, giving us details of uh, deal size um, and who was involved. And this is covering bonds and loans. And then we also have a bank level data set, which um, gives us a, the yearly investments of the banks in these sectors. And we've got about 900 banks represented in the data. Most of them are involved in both the fossil fuel and the green market. Um, and we also have most of the NZBA members represented in our data, and these represent a big, big part of these markets, um, over 70, over 70% 70 in both the fossil fuel and green sectors. So as you can see from this deal level data, um, some of the loans are funded by a single bank, but many of them are funded by multiple banks, so they're syndicated, and this is where the network analysis is going to come in later. So these syndications generate investments, uh, sorry. Uh, links between the banks via their co-investments. So first, just looking at the overall sectoral level, um, what we can see is that banks have been overwhelmingly focused on fossil fuels in the first half of this decade. And it's only around 2016, 2017 that we see that green bonds and loans start to become a bigger share of overall investments. Um, Looking at absolute volumes, you see that actually there's a very big uptick in 2021, 
and green bonds and loans are almost equaling in value to fossil fuel bonds and loans. But what you can also see is that fossil fuel funding has been relatively stable throughout this time. So just digging. Yeah, fossil mm. green bonds and brown. Sorry, uh, fossil fuel bonds, I should call them. So um, funding coal, oil, gas. Okay, so brown is it's like, yeah, it's the opposite. It doesn't, it's not green. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll call it fossil fuel just to, to it's the opposite, it? avoid confusion. Yeah. Um, so just digging into some of the bank level data to see the range of different behaviors we have. Um, these are the top four banks by fossil fuel investment, um, and it's the American banks that dominate in the sector, and they're pretty representative of what's going on um, at the sectoral level as a whole. So while in the middle of the century, you see this increase in green lending, fossil fuel lending is staying pretty much stable. Some other notable examples in the top 50 um, are actually still increasing their fossil fuel investments. So uh, yeah, some of the there's two Japanese banks featuring here, um, Sumitomo and Mitsui, and also two Canadian banks, Scotia Bank and BMO Capital Markets. There are actually relatively few banks who are systematically switching from brown, sorry, fossil fuel to green assets. Um, the, the leaders in this are the European banks. So here we've got two uh, Norwegian banks, Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse. So the picture is mixed. Um, here are the top 50 banks again, and I'm showing you here um, who is expanding fossil fuels and who is divesting. So on the x-axis, we've got the change in average annual investment from the pre-Paris to the post-Paris era. Um, and what you can see is that a really big portion of these banks are still expanding their fossil fuel investments. Even um, many of the banks signed up to this net zero banking alliance. So highlighting just how far these banks have to go if they're actually going to start shifting their portfolios in any meaningful way. Um, but what's also important to note is that even in this top tier of banks, there's a big range in how much market share these banks have. So here we've overlaid the market share of the banks, which is just um, their investments, their individual investments divided by the investment at the sectoral level. And you see that the most important banks, which are the American banks, JP Morgan, Citi, uh, Wells Fargo, they're really shifting their portfolios very little. So these are the guys who can kind of drive the systemic change and not much is happening. On the green side, um, I'm showing you here the energy supply banking ratio, which I mentioned earlier. So this is the low carbon finance to fossil fuel finance. Um, the leaders in this uh, in this market are again the European banks, but they have a relatively small market share. Whereas the big players, we've got Credit Agricole, BNP Paribas, again JP Morgan actually is is a big player in the green market. Um, their energy supply banking ratio is one or lower, so they're nowhere near this target of four, which is required. So. Coming on to the network analysis, as I mentioned, over 80% of the finance provided to both of these markets comes in the form of syndicated deals. And typically these can be four to six banks. Um, and they're important because they allow projects to be financed, which um, are too big for one for, for a single lender. And it means that the lenders can spread the risk amongst themselves um, and participate in financial opportunities that they couldn't uh, that they couldn't take on on their individual balance sheets. So typically what happens in one of these deals is that a larger, more experienced bank will provide the most finance and then it will approach the other banks in its network, drawing money from the rest of the market. Um, so what this um, aspect of the system means is that the role of a single bank in both the fossil fuel and green market goes well beyond its individual lending activity because it has this ability to pull in capital from the rest of the network. So from the syndicated deal data, we construct these networks of lending. And I've just shown you some snapshots here. And what, what you can see is that um, the, the, the fossil fuel network has a strong hub structure. So there's um, a number of highly connected banks at its core, and then many less connected banks at the periphery. And the green network um, has been evolving rapidly. So it was fairly small and sparse in 2010, but its structure is increasingly becoming this kind of core periphery structure that we also see in the fossil fuel network. So what this core periphery structure implies is that different banks have different structural importance 
In these plots, I'm showing you uh, a pre-Paris and a post-Paris snapshot of the networks. Along the x-axis, I'm plotting the degree centrality of the banks, which is a simple measure of their structural importance. Um, and on the y-axis, I'm plotting the, the volume of deals that they've underwritten. So this isn't their individual investment, it's just the, it's the volume of deals that they've been participated in in, in their syndication. Um, and as expected, what you see is that the, the core, the central banks, are also underwriting um, the greatest volume of deals. Um, so, for example, here we see JP Morgan in the pre-Paris um, period invested, was that, 303 billion individually, but it actually underwrote around $1 trillion worth, $1 trillion worth of deals. Um, and interestingly, if you then look at the post Paris period, it's individually investing less. It's investing only 287 billion, but in terms of the volumes of deals it's participated in, it's investing more. So it's kind of its participation in syndication has increased and it's become more central to the network. So what we want to be seeing is not just banks um, decreasing their individual investment, but moving towards the top left of this plot. So becoming less central, pulling out of deal syndication. Um, and there are a few examples of this. So uh, UBS and Deutsche Bank, you see moving, moving uh, top left and um, showing that they're, they're divesting from syndication. The equivalent picture for the green sector um, is quite interesting. So you see that there's um, been a rapid evolution and the key structural players are only starting to emerge, some of whom are the same as in the brown, uh, sorry, the fossil fuel sector, so JP Morgan and City. And it, this is it's important because these, these core banks have a very potentially very big role to play in growing the green network and green investment. So we wanted to kind of quantify this network effect, which we're calling the mobilization factor, to capture the idea that core banks, through their connections with the rest of the network, mobilize capital from the peripheral banks. So the way we've done this is to run simulations of the green and brown networks on a yearly basis. And essentially what we do in these simulations is each deal in the empirical data is assigned um, a probability distribution over all the syndicates that could have funded it. Um, that's essentially a kind of a clique search. And um, the core banks who are more connected are more likely to appear in the syndicate. So we then assign a probability score for each, or a likelihood score for each bank to appear in the syndicate. And it's the core banks will have a, a high probability of appearing, um, which we infer to mean that they have mobilized money from the rest of the syndicate. So we then compute this mobilization factor, with, which is essentially an average of um, uh, the, the deal size divided by the individual investment weighted by this likelihood score. And this is the results for the year of 2021. So um, we can see that the biggest banks, JP Morgan and Citi, and the big American banks, have um, the largest mobilization factors in both the fossil fuel and the green sector. Um, so what this plot means is essentially that these banks, for every dollar they invest, are pulling in an extra three to four dollars from the rest of the network through their links. Um, so it's also interesting to note that some of the leaders in um, in divestment from fossil fuels who I who, I, who I've mentioned earlier, like UBS, they have a relatively small um, fossil fuel mobilization factor. So it's kind of pointing to the idea that because of these network effects, different banks will have different um, significance to um, to either amplify green growth or to divest from fossil fuels. Um, so that's where we are interested in understanding, um, yeah, what are the most effective divestment scenarios? And here I'll hand over to you, Max. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Um, so uh, I'm Max, hello. Um, and what I'm going to talk about now is sort of runs in parallel to some of the stuff Jamie's been showing. So one of the things we're interested in is how to effectively divest the brown market, uh, the fossil fuel sector. Um, and if you look at this, you know, sort of annual investment over time, you don't really get the impression that divestment is, is happening yet. Uh, there's been a large increase in green investments, but not really a, a comparable decrease in fossil fuel investments. So, so this is something we want to model. Uh, and, and again, we're going to use a network approach, but I, I, I approach it from a slightly different perspective than, than Jamie did. 
And the way we're going to do this is to use bipartite networks between a set of banks. So these are the banks we have involved in the fossil fuel sector and the deals, the projects they're involved in funding. So uh, the network looks something like this. This is sort of a toy example. Uh, and then we have a few sort of specific examples of banks who have pulled out of the sector, or I shouldn't say pulled out, are, are slowly pulling out of the sector. So, so Deutsche Bank's a good example. From Paris onwards, uh, they've been slowly decreasing their fossil fuel investment. Uh, and in the network sense, what that looks like is that uh, a specific bank will divest, and then we'll look at the network. There's a whole bunch of deals, uh, and certain deals will now lack funding because they've had one of their partner banks pull out. Um, now, now, in the case of some of these deals, uh, they're wholly dependent on a specific fund. It's unlikely they're going to find funding. Uh, and in this case, without that funding, this deal is going to collapse. So a project is going to you know, not go ahead. Um, but in the case, case of most deals, there's many banks involved in these syndicates. So they've lost one partner, but many banks are still uh, involved in this, uh, in this deal. And the question is, what are these deals, what are these projects now going to do about the shortfall in funding? Uh, and, and what typically happens is that new banks are found to fill in the shortfall in investment. Um, so, so, so what's happened here is that one bank has pulled out, uh, in this case, let's say Deutsche Bank, uh, and then these projects say, oh no, uh, we've lost funding, what are we gonna do about it? And then that funding has been replaced, it's been substituted by other banks. So, so we're interested in this substitution effect and what to do about it. Okay, so in this scenario, the new banks enter the market, and that means that these deals can now survive and the projects will go ahead. Um, the consequence of this is that there is a gap between divestment at the banking level and divestment at the project level. So uh, if you look uh, you know, at The Guardian, there'll be a, a headline saying Deutsche Bank commits to pulling $100 billion out of the fossil fuel sector. So at the banking level, it looks like $100 billion are being pulled out. But when you look at the project level, it might only be $30 billion. And the reason is that a large number of the projects which have lost funding from Deutsche Bank are now gaining it from you know, JP Morgan or some of the large Japanese banks. Um, so that means that, that we can think of a divestment efficiency. It's the gap between uh, what banks say they are divesting to, to how much is actually divested at the project level. So this is what we're interested in, in studying. The question is, does this actually happen? So, so just as an example, uh, there was this highly controversial um, coal terminal announced uh, almost 10 years ago now in, in Queensland, Australia. Deutsche Bank were the major backer for this project. It's, it's actually part of Adani, who are now in the news for all sorts of other reasons. Uh, but Deutsche Bank pulled out of this project, and that put this project on hold for a long time. This could not go ahead, but lo and behold, seven years later, Standard Chartered and Barclays come along and they say, okay, we're going to fund this project now. And that means that this project now has the capital to move forward, and this substitution effect has basically counteracted Deutsche Bank's attempt to divest from the fossil fuel sector. So yeah, the, the point here is that what the banks say they're doing doesn't necessarily translate to the project level. And, and you can imagine, okay, Deutsche Bank pull out, some new banks replace, okay, now Credit Suisse pull out, Nordea pull out. But as long as we can keep on substituting capital from, from other banks, and there's, there's plenty of banks who are happy to invest in fossil fuels, uh, we're never really going to be able to have effective divestment. So this is what we'd like to model. Now, what's a sensible way of thinking about limiting the substitution effect? That's what we want to think about now. Uh, and one policy proposal that's been discussed a lot recently is something called the one-for-one -one capital requirements rule. So uh, fossil fuels currently, the majority of fossil fuels are not directly matched in the assets held by the bank. So the risk is not all held by the bank. It is you know, spread between its customers. And the idea with the one-for-one -one capital rule is that if you're going to, as a bank, make an investment in fossil fuels, you must have the assets on your book to uh, underwrite the risk of that deal. So, so this sets essentially a capital limit on how much any one bank is allowed to invest. Um, I should say this was actually recently considered by the EU and, and it got quite far in discussions, but the EU has actually decided not to do this in the end. Um, I believe the Bank of England is also considering similar rules, 
uh, but we're still before the stage any of these policies are, are in place. Okay, but if we think about this kind of policy uh, in a network sense, well, what would happen is that deal for some project, let's say this coal mine in Queensland, Australia, they found a partner bank uh, who are willing to invest, but there's a problem. This bank doesn't have the necessary assets to underwrite the funding for this deal. And the consequence is that they can now no longer fill this funding shortfall. This project collapses. And actually, in, in practice, you might even have other banks that, as a consequence, end up divesting from the sector. So, so this is what we'd like to model. And we, you know, we're using this network approach. So, so the sort of template works like this. What we're going to do is one at a time, we're going to choose a bank to divest. That can be done randomly or with specific orders. Uh, each time we do that, we're going to look for the deals affected by that bank divesting. Uh, for each project affected, we're going to search for new finance, either from close partners or partners at random. There's different ways of doing it. And then we ask about this one-for-one -one capital rule. Are these banks capable of fi filling the funding shortfall without breaking some limit in their capital requirements? Uh, if no, the deal survives. If yes, the deal deal collapses and there's actual divestment at the project level. And then we just repeat that over and over again and increase the number of banks divesting. Unfortunately, oh, my screen's back. We do not currently actually have the uh, capital assets for the banks uh, for the one for one threshold. Uh, but what we're going to do just as a proxy for now, we're going to look at the total brown investments, fossil fuel investments made by each bank in 2021. And we're going to add some percentage to that. So a 10% threshold, a 50% threshold. And we're going to say that is the limit. You are not allowed to invest above that threshold. And then we study this model basically as we change that threshold. Okay, so uh, a, a few results and then I'll wrap up. So the first consequence of, of, of this substitution effect is what I discussed before, is, is this efficiency gap. So, so what we're looking at here on the x-axis, we have the number of banks who have divested. So we, we continuously choose a bank to randomly divest. Um, and then here, what we have on the uh, y-axis, uh, these numbers are wrong, by the way. It should be 200, 400, 600. It's out by a factor of 10. Uh, the, the blue line is the bank level divestment. This is what the Guardian headline will say. Deutsche Bank commits to divesting $100 billion from uh, the fossil fuel sector. But then this red line, this is how it translates to the, D, to the project level. So the blue is what appears to be the divestment. The red is what's actually divested, and there's a gap between this divestment. Uh, and, and, and this is an efficiency gap. Um, and what we find is that as we change the threshold, so we can say a bank can increase the uh, investment by 30%, 100%, 1,000%. What you see is that the number of banks that need to divest before you have any actual divestment at the project level increases quite dramatically. So if only a very small number of banks divest, substitution means there's effectively zero impact at the actual project level. Of course, if you know 70% of all banks divest, yes, eventually you're going to have effects at the project level. Uh, but if you just randomly choose a few banks to divest, there is essentially no effect at the network level. Um, the consequence of this is that if we increase this threshold, uh, which limits the substitution effect. So if we let banks, you know, increase their investments without any limit, there's a rapid loss in the efficiency of divestment. Um, so, so in this figure I've shown in the previous, I've just chosen banks to divest at random, but what we can do instead is choose them in size order. So instead of choosing, you know, the regional bank of Northwest Germany, we can choose JP Morgan City and we can divest strategically in size order. Uh, and if you do that, you do see an increase in efficiency because of the networked position of the last large banks. Uh, so so uh, these dotted lines, uh, this one here in the middle is for random divestment. Uh, here on the left is for uh, order divestment by bank size. Um, the dashed lines are the same, just for a much, much larger threshold. And you basically see that by targeting large banks first, there's, you need to convince far fewer partners to divest 
before you actually see effects at the project level. Um, the actual change in the average efficiency of divestment is quite small, but the real large effect is, is in how many partners you need to convince to divest. Um, in terms of specific banks involved, this is a little bit similar to what Jamie talked about in terms of the, um, uh, the mobilization of key banks. Uh, but we, what we can do with this network model is we can run the model uh, where a bank commits to divest and the same bank doesn't commit to divest. And then we can see what fraction of the market can that one bank facilitate by themselves. Uh, and what you see is that just a handful of banks can facilitate almost half the market just by themselves. Uh, the way this is done is essentially by saying that when you redirect finance, you're going to go to your close partners first. And, and it turns out that 70% of all deals, JP Morgan is a close partner of the syndicate they are working with. Whereas uh, if you look at some another big bank, for instance, someone like Goldman Sachs, you'd expect them to play a big role, but only actually about 15% of deals consider Goldman Sachs a major partner in their deal. Um, okay, so almost the last result. Uh, just thinking about how this has changed over time, there's a question about whether we are moving to a position where divestment is becoming easier or whether we are moving away from that. So it's becoming, you know, fossil fuel market is actually becoming more robust. Um, and there's some indication that because divestment efficiency is dropping over time, the market is actually getting more resilient, not less resilient. It's not a hugely convincing figure. I wouldn't, you know, attach too much stock to this, but it's an interesting indication that we're probably not heading in the right direction yet. Um, cool. So that's everything for the network. Um, just to conclude what Jamie talked about and, and, and my slides as well. So, you know, since the Paris Agreement, we really have seen a very, very large increase in green investment. Uh, but the question is still, why are we not seeing uh, a decrease uh, in, in, in fossil fuel investments uh, and, and how can we improve strategies for divestment to actually make the bank level divestment translate to the project level. Um, if we exploit these network effects, we can strategically work with certain banks to divest and have far more effect in the network of brand investments. Um, but currently with substitution of capital, it seems like it's going to be very, very difficult to effectively divest from the market. Um, as I mentioned before, there are policies considered, the one for one capital requirements rule, the EU have considered it, the Bank of England are considering it, but nothing's happened yet. So a lot of this is about, you know, building evidence for, for the need for these rules. Great. Thank you very much. Uh,